Okay, so in this video, I'm going to show a simple example of an IoT device interacting with the blockchain. Um, I've made another video like this before, but my iPhone was acting up. I still use an iPhone 5 to film my videos. And I'll try to start off really quick and make the video as short as I can. And I'll show it off real quick and then explain how it works. So, and I'm going to control the device through my Ether wallet right here. And this is it right there. I'm using an ESP01, which is a Wi Fi enabled microcontroller. And we're going to use a smart contract to turn this LED on and off. And there's also a temperature sensor right here, which is posting data onto the blockchain, also. And this um, ESP8266, um, like I said, it's Wi Fi enabled. And it is connected via Wi-Fi to this Wi-Fi router right here. And this Wi-Fi router is running an instance of a Go Ethereum node. So, and so this chip is interacting with that node and sending RPC calls to that. So I'm gonna turn I'm going to turn this light on and then I'll show you real quick how it works. So we're gonna do it. So if you were on the other side of the world and you were watching this, and I had this thing plugged in, um, you have to use pretty heavy duty batteries sometimes, or fully charged batteries, these chips are finicky. Um, you would have to, you'd be able to control it. So this is this video is like this technique is kind of an alternative to MQTT brokers and things. And I'm using the RinkB network and I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> So, through my Ether, <coughs> Ether wallet, like I said, I'm going to be on RinkB. Um, it's a test network, and I actually prefer RinkB. I kind of like proof of authority, private networks. Um, <clears throat> and so that's one of the things, if you were to interact with this, it's one of the first things you want to set, so make sure you're on RinkB. And then, um, if you've seen other videos like I've done, I've shown how to interact with contracts. And the contract that we'll be interacting with is here. That's the smart contract address. And also you need the ABR for the smart contract in order to interact with it. And thanks to Etherscan, I can post my source code and it will provide the ABI for me right here. And I can plug that into here. And then I should be able to access, select my functions, and here we go. Hopefully you should be able to see this pretty well. Um, and there will be a function in here called turn light on. And I'm going to unlock one of my wallet files. We'll do this one. My Ether wallet um, is kind of slow sometimes, and a lot of times when I try to use it and unlock a wallet, it will freeze like it just did, and it will freeze again in a second. <sighs> <clears throat> there we go. And I wrote my smart contract that you have to send at least one Ether to it to uh, turn the light on and my gas limit I'll set it to pretty high just for speed's sake 100,000 if you're new to this blockchain stuff this is probably all very confusing but <clears throat> yes I am sure it makes sense so this is transacting and the blocks refresh every 15 seconds so hopefully within 15 seconds this light will turn on <clears throat> oh, I'm reading I'm watching this oh I did just turn on I was watching the serial console <laughs> so yeah there you go 
I just used the blockchain to turn on a little LED with, via a little microcontroller that's connected via Wi-Fi to a, um, a geth node run on batteries, not the best batteries. And it's also posting as temperature, so I'll get to that now too. Um, and I can turn the light off also via the blockchain. There's another function on there uh, in here. Going back to my other wallet. There is another function called uh, um, <clears throat> where is it? Oh, turn light off, admin only, that's why. That's where only I can do it because I'm the owner of the contract. So I can turn the LED off if I want. Actually, I should turn the LED. No, I'm not going to waste time on this, vi this video. So, um, so yeah, lights on. And this is a, uh, what is this? It's a DS18, I think it's called. A, uh, yeah, DS18B20 temperature sensor. And I have a DHT11 um, humidity and temperature sensor, but those things are kind of finicky. Um, I have a hard time getting them started especially with these ESP8266s. So, going back to the contract, um, I'm not going to get too much into like how the blockchain works and how you interact with it, but there's a variety of ways to read smart contracts, and this IoT device is sending stuff, it's, in, it's posting as temperature. Um, every time the temperature changes by one degree, and I think I programmed it that every five minutes it will post its temperature also. So if the temperature drops one degree, it will post up onto the smart contract. And um, it's a co um, to read it, anybody can do that. I can read it now via um, Etherscan. And as you can see here, it's 72 degrees. <clears throat> and it also puts the recent block number also. And... <clears throat> To look at the source code for the smart contract, it's actually very basic. Um, when you write these smart contracts on the blockchain, I've read some places where you kind of have to code them like you're writing for a microcontroller, keep them very short. And if I go into detail about the source code, <coughs> it might be easier if I use Vim. <coughs> So I have a lot of glare too. So this might help a little bit. Not really, but sorry about the glare. Um, yeah, writing these uh, Solidity smart contracts is kind of um, easy to learn if you have any programming experience. And the function, so like turn light on, it, it does that. I think people might who are watching this video are more interested in how the microcontroller interacts and how my geth node works also. Um, <clears throat> so I'll post the link for the etherscan contract and you can read that. And all the, the function for um, where is turn light on is right here. And all this function does is it just changes the boolean value of a variable that's in here. And all this ESP82 um, is doing is it's just checking the blockchain and seeing what the value of that boolean is um, every 15 seconds. And that's actually wasting battery right here. You know, I could change this to um, check the blockchain every five minutes or something, or every one minute um, for an update status, depending on what type of device it is. Um, and if you had a private blockchain, you could um, modify your chain to update, refresh every five seconds or every 10 seconds. Um, <clears throat> And then there's some other functions in here as far as being able to check the status of that. And I kept them pretty simple. If I had to rewrite this contract, I would put events into all of these things. So that way I, there would be like a kind of database of information um, that I could go through as far as what the temperature is. So going back to it, um, temperature is still 72 degrees here. And now I'll get to the kind of microcontroller side. Here's the uh, serial terminal I have running on this. That's what's kind of cool about these chips. The zero ones, this is a ESP01. This is a ESP12, which is the more common one. And this is one made by Adafruit and they have a full breakout board on it. And they have like the buttons you can push to um, help program it. <laughs> and if you don't do it that way, I have, you have to make your kind of own board to program it as far as 
hit um, set on the GPO pin and the reset pin when you want to flash it. Um, but there's plenty of documentation about these chips and all kinds of things you can do with it. And here's my serial cord line. And the, probably the easiest serial cord for programming these things. Not just programming them, but also interfacing with them is um, just a basic Raspberry Pi. They sell them as Raspberry Pi serial cords, but you can use them for every, everything as far as TTL, serial, USB ports. And so here's my serial console. I'll try to get a more closer look. So all the controller is really doing is it's um, sending these JSON um, commands via HTML to this uh, GEF node that I have running. And it's asking it to read contracts. And there's not, <laughs> finding documentation on how to write these um, JSON queries is a little bit hard. It's not that easy um, for Ethereum right now, but it's out there. Um, so, and these are the Boolean values that it's getting back. Um, and then down here you can see the temperature and I have some counters set where the, when the counter gets to a certain point, it will just automatically post a temperature. If the temperature changes, we'll do that. These two queries here are, don't cost anything um, as far as fuel or gas, you would say, when you're interacting with Ethereum blockchain. Um, to read from the block it doesn't cost anything. So this chip can do this all day as long as I have um, connection to a node. And the um, eventually in here, so like if I blow on this temperature chip, um, I'm going to try not to knock my phone over. I'll see if I can raise the temperature on the chip and then it's going to, you'll see in the serial that it will um, post. <laughs> okay, bring it up here and blow on it. You'll see another JSON query it looks a little bit different. And it's going to be um, posting onto the blockchain. And that actually costs a little bit of money. Oh, there it goes. Wait, did it? Yeah, temperature is up to 77 now. So right in here is where it's posting on there. And this transaction here is actually a little bit insecure um, as far as inside of my LAN. If you were um, a hacker and you're able to get inside my Wi-Fi LAN, then you'd be able to get my password for my key. But then you'd have to get my private key off of the router. And I'll get to that part. It's the last part of my video. Um, so yeah, it's my serial console going. And now that I'm done breathing on the sensor, the temperature will start going down and it will start posting onto the blockchain again. This is RinkB, so it's all test ether and it's all free. And so I think for IoT networks, you'll see private networks. You won't see a lot of IoT devices on the main net. I don't know, because to post sensor data every few minutes. So if I, ref this is the contract page for the smart contract. If I refresh it, phew. so all these transactions here are the um, ESP posting temperature data. So if I go into the contract, and you'll see how much gas it costs and everything like that, and how much ether it costs. So 0.001 ether um, every time it posted. And I actually set the um, prices kind of high so I'd get a quick transmission. Um, like I'm using 30 GUE, I think they pronounce it, where I think the average price is 21 GUE. Um, and so uh, I think I'm getting into too much detail about the exact technology of blockchain, but, and then here's the function set device temp, um, and device only. And then this is the hexadecimal. If I converted this to a decimal value, it would be something in the seventies cause I'm having a post Fahrenheit temperatures. So it's about 72 in here. Um, so then, and if I go back to the contract, I have to go back page and I read the smart contract again uh, see the temperature is 73 now and is temperature current and I'll say true and now if I wanted to make sure this device was still online there is a function in here that I wrote to update the temperature and you actually have to pay ether to do that and it will change one of the variables on the contract 
ESP reads it and it will send the temperature to the device. <clears throat> so, well, going back to the contract. So if this was set to false, the uh, ESP would read that on one of its 15 second refreshes and it would um, send the temperature up. And the ESP will also change this back to true. Is light turned on? Same thing, true. And then the light is still turned on. <clears throat> So now if I get to the, I can get into the ESP source code and I posted this on my GitHub. <laughs> it's one of the few things on my GitHub. <clears throat> Hopefully you can read this all right. So, and there's a, tons of documentation about um, using the Arduino interface um, and a few other IDEs to program ESP 8266s. Um, <clears throat> And in this, and then another important library I'd use was this Arduino JSON library to help create my JSON queries. Um, and then just initializing all my variables and getting the Wi-Fi connection set up right here. A function to you know, call the temperature sensor and get the um, Fahrenheit and Celsius temperatures. This is another function to just basically contact the uh, interface the um, geth node the ethereum node that i'm running it's, it's a, one of the ringby nodes and so like here's the ip address and port of where that node is and 8545 is the typical port that ethereum nodes will have open on their rpc their json rpc and this 192 um 168.2.1 that's kind of like a local lan address but the 2.1 right here, that's um, not a local thing on the, my desktop or anything that's running on my router. And I'll show you that um, here too. And then so, and then we get into our main loop here and checking the status. And then a, the, a lot of the bulk of this code is just building the JSON queries, um, the strings. I was tempted to just write the strings and you know, um, Put the quotations in and just make the strings myself but just for like reusability and you can change values and just i think it's going to be code good practice that you'll have this and i think in the future there'll be maybe um, microcontroller libraries for interacting with ethereum here soon um and then i create the strings so i'm making a string here that's calling the contract and um as it's calling the function and in this, you don't call it by the function name. You have to take the function name. So here it's calling the function um, is light turned on. But you have to take the function name and convert it to hexadecimal or something. And then run it through a SHA-3 algorithm. And then take the first four bytes. And then that's what you tag onto this thing. That's what's getting input here. And so it's kind of hard and a little bit confusing. It's actually what's going on under the hood if you're using um, the JavaScript Web3 libraries. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just building these JSON strings and then posting those. And I'm using the, um, this is, ESP is actually like an HTTP client. And I think you'll see more people who, who are, might get into this. They'll use the, uh, this is uh, in client mode, but you'll see it act in a, server mode will we'll have like an open port on it and then what happen is they'll have no js running on wherever their um, on-premise ethereum node is running and no js listens and that's what interacts with the microcontroller this microcontroller the iot device is what this is and just so if you're unfamiliar with iot devices and you think oh no big deal well just because i can turn a light on well you can replace this light with a relay and so I could use this to turn on, you know, um, any kind of device, your TV or your whole house lights. So you just have to think big picture with a small little thing like that. So going through the code. And I think the big whopper here, <clears throat> I'm gonna go, hopefully, just real quick. When I tried to understand how IoT devices work on the blockchain, there's a lot of kind of I don't know, like vaporware talk or just, and I think a lot of people that are interacting with it um, are don't want to share how they do it because they're, they're still trying to just, it's proprietary. So the only examples I can really find that real like, you know, examples with source code 
was Dallas Ethereum, and they're kind of the, really the someone on the forefront of embedded Ethereum. <clears throat> their IoT Blink example um, was a good one, and that's how an example of them running Node.js. But what this thing is doing is it's listening, and I don't think it's posting data onto the blockchain. So I wanted to see an example of something posting data onto the blockchain. IBM did a project called Adept um, in conjunction with Samsung. Um, they don't really have do that much documentation about that. I mean, there's plenty of slides and um, talk about it, but they don't really show like any source code or whatnot. So I wanted to know how to post data onto the blockchain. So I guess I just kind of hacked my own method and going back to my microcontroller code. So yeah, forming um, JSON queries to read data off the blockchain is kind of, I don't want to say trivial, but easy um, if you have access to a Ethereum node. And that's easy to set those nodes up. And there's some documentation about that on the internet. But posting data onto it, a microcontroller doing it, I had to do it. Um, the technique I used was a function called, where are you? Um, well, not a function, but the API, personal send transaction. And that's actually not a very common one that people use. Um, it's a little bit insecure. And I just kind of thought, then the, the alternative is that you have the account unlocked on the um, node, the local node, on-premise node all the time, um, or only, or whatnot. So what this thing does is somewhere in here, I think it's, oh, right here, I have to transmit the password. And this, um, this right here, this send transaction, personal send transaction, all it will do is it unlocks the account just for this transaction, and then once the transaction is done, it relocks the account on the local node. And what I would like to see is a way that I could put the private key onto this um, chip here and have it make a raw transaction and sign it on the chip and then transmit that. And that would be mm, the bee's knees. <laughs> and I think there's going to be close ways to that. Um, I think there is a, actually I go to my old video real quick. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I think I opened up a discussion on and I might actually delete this video I don't think anybody's gonna pay attention because I only have about 10 40 followers or something um, I started this discussion on the stack exchange for Ethereum about signing the transaction on a microcontroller, um, I was able to find two, two things. Esprino, and you can actually run Esprino on an ESP01. Um, getting the IDE set up is kind of hard. So some advice if you try this, try to set the ID up through the, um, using a, again, using a serial cable like this instead. So once you have the um, firmware installed, you can connect to it just through a command like Minimoto or screen but um, so there's that using a spring and what you can do is try to get the um, <clears throat> Ethereum importing all this JavaScript onto the chip the problem with microcontrollers is is if you try to you can't use NPM or anything like that the JavaScript all has to be on one file you can't use things like uh, it just it's you have to read the documentation <laughs> and then the other big thing is um, this guy got pretty close this is one of the big developers for my ether wallet I believe and he tried to get um, ethereum to, to sign on Arduino and I tried to compile the code real quick and got an error and then I haven't really looked into it too much but I hope to and it looks like he was able to get all the libraries on so that way you can do the key cack or whatever and the elliptical curve um, algorithm on a microcontroller. 
and I think you could fit it all onto a ESP01, which has 512 kilobytes, or what people will probably use is an ESP12, which has four megabytes, so you could probably fit a good megabytes worth of the whole JavaScript library, condense it down, and get the signature algorithms all on there using Esperino. So those those two things, and I'll try to put that I'll put that Stack Exchange link in the video. So, and then I think the other big important thing, and this thing's still chucking along. And if you're new to interacting with the blockchain, I'm showing I've been interacting with either scan, reading it that way. I think if I refresh it, the temperature might be different. Oh, it's 74 now. Um, the contract source is available, and it's pretty straightforward, where it's just basically changing some Boolean values. Yeah, true and false, as far as whether the temperature should be posting, um, and whether the light's on or not. And then users can change that, and by changing it, the light will turn on. And then, um, and then so there's all that, ABIs, if you're, know about blockchain, you should know what all this is. And then another way to read from it, I can also read via this way, and it's free too. You don't need a ring fee account. If you know the address, you know the ABI, you can automatically read things. So I can do get temp, and there we go, 74, and that's the block number. So going to the current block number and how I run my node, I said I'm on ring fee. Um, I like ring fee. I like the proof of authority aspect and I like pr private networks. Um, I like the uh, IoT kind of side of blockchain. I'm not that big into the financial side. So private networks, um, things in proof of authority seems like it's most efficient for embedded devices. Um, so the current block is one, two, oh, five, eight, oh, six. A lot of people just run their nodes on their desktops, um, either with um, Ethereum wallet or whatnot. So this is that one, two, what's up, sets. I run mine on, and the light's still on. I'm using a used Wi-Fi router, and the Geth node's running here. And the kicker is, is that it's running in full mode, basically. Well, well the first time it synced, it went into fast mode, but it's not running in light mode and everybody you know when you see all the examples of raspberry pi and stuff um they'll try and they'll show you them running it in light mode and developers would tell me that too they say run it in light mode and i never ran it in the light mode i think the one time i tried to run it in light mode it didn't work fast enough and i gave up so this is um www.rinkaby.io and this is where also your faucet would be um <clears throat> so going back to network stats just to show that I'm fully synced I uh, show off the router so it's a TP link WDR 3600 it's a pretty common router and it's starting to become kind of obsolete everybody's upgrading to AC I'm going to get into the text about it real quick um, hopefully you can read this so it's MIPS 32 uh, which is pretty uncommon well I get people if I bring it up and say I want to run it on MIPS say MIPS why MIPS and run on a router 560 uh, 560 megahertz CPU and 128 megabytes of RAM so yeah and there it is and the secret to getting these things to run on these used routers is you also have to be able to flash OpenWRT onto it. And I did make a video about that, but again, my phone was acting up, so I might delete that video. But the instructions for getting OpenWRT are all available online. And then cross-compiling um, Geth uh, has a page. And I just used uh, Docker. There's pages in here about Xgo. You have to use Xgo and Docker and the make file. 
and when you use the make file you have to edit it usually if you're building for arm when you build for a mips architecture it's edited so that it will build the library statically with it um, i found out if you same thing with arm you have to add these flags to the arm things too or usually it won't run on openwrt because openwrt uses a different kind of um, microcontroller library c library um, they use something called like muscle um, it's, it's, and uh, so you have to edit that. <clears throat> I won't go too much into the cross compiling process. Also, if you're going to use it on MIPS um, for a router like this, you have to build the system yourself using, <clears throat> you have to enable floating point emulator. You have to build the system yourself you can, what I did was I just installed the default firmware that was on here. Um, and then I also, and then I built my own version using, a, you have to do an open WRT build system, which is pretty easy. Um, I did have one error, but there was um, a fix for it in the GitHubs. Um, <clears throat> and then, but oh yeah, I'm starting to ramble <laughs> as usual. Um, before you start compiling, you have to go into the, open another menu called kernel <clears throat> menu config or something and enable FPU. <clears throat> FPU emulator, um, yeah, so, and here's the thing about it, Harse here. But you have to make sure you have that enabled for, you have to build your own OpenWRT system um doing that and it takes about two hours for it to compile uh, well i have a slow processor but it took me about two hours to compile it and then once it's compiled i just did a sys upgrade with that new firmware image and and then it's running right there right now on this and i got this router for about 10 bucks i think a 16 gigabyte um usb drive i had laying around and i had to format this drive i use linux program gparted so that the first two gigabytes is swap, and then the rest of it was formatted to ext4 file system. <clears throat> and then I go show you that it's synced. Here's rink B in the most current block. Oh, sorry, is 8.17. Oh, wait, never mind, 8.32. And here's my most current block running here, 8.32. This laptop is ssh into this router. Um, and this has its own firewall going on and this router is connected that's WAN connection is connected to my home router and that home router is a I love those things <clears throat> you could probably run um, the main net maybe on that and you'd have to use a USB 3 cable because that has USB 3 uh, port on it and you'd have to use a solid state drive like this and you'd have to have a pretty big one at this rate <laughs> um one terabyte i would say and you might be able to get the main net running on that it has a dual processor on it but this is 500 mega about 500 megahertz mips so there it is and i will try to ssh real in real quick and get uh show you the performance So if I run HTOP, and when I compiled the binary, I had to re, um, I just renamed it so that it's MIPS32, and this system is Big Eddian. <clears throat> and as you can see, I'm running on Rinkby network, and I had to make sure I opened the RPC port, which again was on 8545. Here's the RPC address. So this address is actually um, behind the firewall. It's not open to the WAN. So that's, I was kind of, I feel a little bit comfortable use, opening up this personal via the API 
which as I say you're not supposed to do. And then my data directory is on the USB drive. And as you can see, I also have a swap right here. Two gigabits of swap. You need that going on. Well, not so much two gigabits, but you can probably do it one. I'm just, just being careful. Set it to two, and that was it. So yeah, I have it just running on there, and I can actually do a geth, what did I call it? MIPS32 Big Eddian. Oh, it's not in this path yet, so I have to give it the full path. Oh, it's working. <laughs> Oh, um, there's actually a hack for this, but I'm not going to get into it because it'll take a while. <clears throat> but if anybody wants to know, just post in the comments or something. I don't know, 36 minutes. But yeah, there you go. That's how I got my little IoT device interacting with the blockchain. Um, I think it's an alternative to MQTT uh, brokers and stuff. Um, if you're using a private network, if I put this on the main network, it would probably cost me about... <laughs> maybe 25 cents every time this thing posted its uh, temperature <laughs> and users have to pay you know a few cents to turn the light on or something or if they want to know the temperature right now the updated temperature and then yeah and I just run my nodes on use routers you know 500 megahertz MIPS 128 gigabyte RAM it's all about and it can support USB that's the most important part and then it makes its own little Wi-Fi network and then this ESP8266 connects to it and then if anybody's watching and you're pretty decent at C then please <laughs> address this uh, stack exchange that I opened up or whatnot about signing on the chip if it can that's the I would like to see is that you could put the private key on here and then have it sign it on there and then send the raw transaction. And if it can send the raw transaction, it doesn't even need to send it to there. There's a lot of public nodes online, even Etherscan, where you can send the raw transaction if it's signed to there. Um, and then that will post it. So, yeah, thanks for watching. In 37 minutes, but I think that's pretty good. And that's the nitty gritty. I think the very, very simple basics of how you would get an IoT device on there with the source code and whatnot. And then once you start modding that and getting creative, um, I think you could do some pretty cool projects. So thank you for watching.